And, uh, yeah, and all my work is, you know, through the fishing game department. And I work for the non-gaming endangered wildlife program, which is run mostly through federal grants and donations. Oh, well, this big giant monkey made me feel better. So let's, let's stop being mean to this big giant monkey anymore. Yeah, that's my food source. <laughs> He's doing stuff for us. It's, it's fine. <laughs> He's not going to kill us, though. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's quite fascinating. That Anybody who wants to do conservation work with endangered species in the state has to have training, has to have a scientific collection permit through us, and they have to follow um, some pretty strict protocols for handling animals especially anybody who is in uh, the pet trade, because a lot of studies now are showing that pathogens can stay on your skin for longer than they thought. And so if you're feeding your Gulf Coast box turtles in your you know, yard pen or whatever, and then you're going out and handling a wild Eastern box turtle, you could be transmitting a, a pathogen through that turtle and then that population. So. There's a very kind of strict protocol for working with endangered species, especially handling them. Um, so that's the one thing that I think that anybody who wants to get involved in that stuff, contact your state agency, figure out the process, start volunteering, and you know get that information, get those references in place, so that you have a good idea, a good idea of how these things can. Um, affect wild populations because I, I think a lot of people you know don't understand how bad it can get and it's not well public but the, the reality is is it's just one species in part of a, as part of a, a bigger food web an ecosystem and this umbrella of biodiversity and the one thing that we know is that as biodiversity biodiversity decreases the more pathogens jump into human populations because what we're doing when biodiversity gets suppressed is we're artificially selecting the specialist. And so here in New Hampshire, when biodiversity gets low in certain areas, white-footed mice come and fill those gaps. White-footed mice, are, they, they can survive in almost any different habitat that you put in the landscape. They also happen to be the reservoir for Lyme disease, and the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And that has serious consequences for humans, especially here in New Hampshire. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a huge problem. And there's other parts of that, but, um, but protecting biodiversity is you know, going to basically be a buffer uh, between animal disease and human disease. So we are here today with New Hampshire biologist, state biologist, the uh, Josh, I just literally blinked. That's okay. It's Megacy. Okay, Josh Megacy. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started? Like, Yeah, sure. So um, I grew up in... Massachusetts and New Hampshire, sort of back and forth. Um, and ever since, you know, before I can even remember, um, I just had an, a deep interest in reptiles and amphibians. Um, my earliest memories are catching little snakes and turtles and frogs and salamanders. And uh, it just continued my whole life. And um, I pursued a degree in wildlife biology and um, at UNH. And then from there, I got into various different wildlife conservation um, fields, uh, shorebirds, other projects. And then um, luckily, I sort of ended up where I really wanted to be, which was um, working with reptiles and amphibians, and specifically uh, turtles. And so turtles have been my specialty for the last 10 years. And so I work with. Um, Mostly state-listed um, turtles, so 
That would be wood turtles, landings turtles, spotted turtles, and eastern box turtles. And uh, yeah, and all my work is, you know, through the fishing game department. And I work for the non-gaming endangered wildlife program, which is run mostly through federal grants and donations. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. We're going to get into that a little later because that's that's super important and very interesting. And uh, when I'm curious, does uh, wildlife biology degrees, does that include uh, organic chemistry? Yeah. yeah. OK, great. That's 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 awesome. Like yeah, it's yeah. Uh, for people out there that may not know if you go get a degree that actually has anything to do with medic medication of any kind, you have to get organic chemistry. If you do not have organic chemistry, you do not have the basis for understanding DNA and just how things group together on a molecular level. So that's just something I was curious about. Yeah, yeah. there's a fundamental understanding of biology through organic chemistry. It, it really does. So people that may not understand the, because there are biology degrees that you can get that do not require organic chemistry. I had a bunch of people in my organic chem class that were biologists that went to a different biology so they wouldn't have to take organic chem <laughs> because it is very difficult. I don't blame them. Yeah. It's the way they test it. I don't think the subject was that, that hard. It's the testing of it. So, yep. yeah. yeah. And to be clear, my, you know, my field is very much uh, population and ecology. And so, the organic chemistry stuff is not something that I'm I'm using, but uh, mo most of the most of the work that I do is um, is like inventory and monitoring, and uh, you know statistical analysis. That's that's important stuff too. Yeah, people don't realize how important math actually is. Yeah, and statistics in particular, like take as many statistics classes as you can. It's yeah, I actually have a uh, associates in physics, okay, okay, and a bachelor's in polymer chemistry focused on medical tech. I studied how to target cancer cells, Zika and Ebola through polymers to actually do that, and then plastics. And I also did uh, some work in communication. I actually did a study in nonverbal human communication. That has been very helpful for animals. And so sometimes these extra little classes, I'm sure like when it comes to medicating your your turtles, I'm sure it's it has a massive impact to have that underneath, you know, basic understanding of organic chemistry. Like this is probably how this is going to have an impact on this, this turtle organically. Mm -hmm. And organic chemistry actually doesn't mean it grows out of the ground. It means that it has a carbon atom to it. That's actually what organic chemistry means for anybody watching. Great. That's just a... So, now let's go ahead and get into the laws real quick. I figure that's something I've... Uh, it, it seems pretty straightforward, and I, I, I like that you guys actually do a very good job. I'll, I'll link it in below. Yeah. yeah. I can, yeah, it's, uh, I can send you the link if you need it. I've, I've got you, because you guys put it right there with the fishing game. It's super easy to find. This is what you can keep. This is what you can't keep. This is, yep, yep. Or, yeah. Is, uh, so how does that work for you guys? Like, because you've got, I mean, venomous, yeah. I didn't realize you guys have rattlesnakes up there, or a rattlesnake. We have two rattlesnakes. Um, we have a couple very, very small populations. Yeah, there's another site that I have found that actually does really good on uh, giving information on each state. Yeah. And that's, yeah, so it was very appealing on that one. Uh, like, because it looks like you guys just have turtles and snakes. Like, it doesn't really look like you guys got lizards that... Uh, for reptiles, that's correct. 
and which is which is interesting to me so i mean lizards lizards are what i do i don't i'm not a snake guy i don't i can hold them i just don't seem to care like it's yeah. just like if you hand me an eighty thousand dollar snake and a ten dollar snake i'm gonna look at them and i'm gonna look at that behavior and i'm gonna be like oh my god this is so cool like like the flicking of the tongues a little bit more the flicking of, you know it's become comfortable it's not comfortable it wants to do this and i'm gonna find it fascinating and i'm gonna hand it back to you and we'll go buy the 30 dollar lizard on the table yeah that, that's me but like probably with turtles for you you know you're gonna go look at the turtles yeah i mean i i'm all i i'm fascinated by all of them so i can't say that i'm like snake turtle you know amphibian like i i really get excited about all of them so yeah i just don't do the morph thing yeah I, yeah I prefer understanding the behaviors of them and that's why i cater to lizards more yeah. and it's it's quite fascinating like i was talking in one video it's it's interesting when you've actually spent the time with the animal and you've gotten that animal to feel more comfortable and better like healthier that animal actually knows that like that's that's something that goes into its memory like oh well this big giant monkey made me feel better so let's let's stop being mean to this big giant monkey anymore yeah that's my food source <laughs> he's doing stuff for us it's, it's fine <laughs> he's not gonna kill us no yeah. yeah no it's it's quite fascinating that so um you were talking about some of your projects what are some of the big uh, takeaways from your projects that you've done that we should note as a public well so um because i deal with populations across the state um and i work uh regionally as well so all the work we do is compared regional because you know my my um jurisdiction is new hampshire but the turtles have no political boundaries and and so we need to work to conserve the entire range not just you know one state so we work together frequently the biologists from all the different states and um basically we go in and we monitor the populations every five years and so early on he was identifying where these populations were in the state how much land was there for them to use what the habitat was like um getting population estimates and then we go back in five years we sort of re-inventory the populations and see if we can detect any declines or increases in the population at the time <clears throat> and as part of that, we also use radio telemetry. So on wild turtles, we put radio transmitters on them and we'll track them throughout the year. That gives us a really good idea of how the turtles are using the different wetlands, how they're using the upland habitats as well, because turtles, many of them are semi-aquatic and semi-terrestrial, so they're kind of using both habitats frequently. With that information, then we can, we can implement conservation action and so we can do things like creating nesting habitat if it's limited or protecting more land if the area is getting you know rapidly developed we can upgrade culverts for aquatic passage you know under roads and highways um we also do um yeah turtle crossing things and things like that in areas where turtles are crossing roads where there's wetlands on either side and so that's kind of the bulk of my work um there's a lot of details in between and um yeah, i do spend a little bit of time monitoring some amphibian populations <clears throat> and some snake projects as needed um and so the big threats here in new hampshire are the same threats that there are in every other state uh which is just loss of habitat number one um the faster the landscape gets developed the faster those turtle populations decline road mortality is huge um especially during the nesting season when females are wandering around looking for areas to lay their eggs um and then the other big thing that's sort of on the on the radar 
is just collection of turtles. So either illegally for the pet trade or just casually for, you know, curiosity when people moving them around. Um, there's a couple things that happen <clears throat> um, when people move turtles around. Sometimes they can take turtles and they can introduce them into different uh, wetlands and different habitats. And they can actually transmit diseases to populations where diseases weren't present. And so this is the way invasive species work too. Humans move things around and suddenly you have a big problem. And that's what happened with like white nose syndrome with bats, countless other plants and other species where you have these big, huge population booms of a non-native species and they can outcompete the native species and so forth and so forth. So we encourage, even though we have, you know, in our laws, you know, it's, it's lawful to, you know, keep a painted turtle or a snapping turtle or a musk turtle. We encourage the people don't because once it's removed from that wild population, it's pretty much gone from that population forever. And so if it's a reproductive female, it's no longer contributing to the next generation of turtles. Um, and typically they can't be released because once they're captive, especially if they're captive with other pet turtles, even fish, they can get diseases from those, those other organisms and, and then get reintroduced into the wild. Plus the exact thing that I talked about before that I enjoy about the lizards, where they actually do that, that actually has that impact of when you put them back in the wild. That's why there's special people to do rehabs for wildlife. Right. Not everybody should do it. I watched a video on uh, like why the dodo is bad, the uh, YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And the, just the way that they show these animals, people, and one of the biggest things that they took away from it was the amount of people who were commenting in the comments saying that they tried to save a bird and that bird died because of their care. And it's like, yeah, like that's, you, you know, they are not equipped to do that. I tried to save a bird at work. I don't know if it got saved or not because I knew what the hell I was doing. And I picked it up out of the road, put it in the grass where it could not just all of a sudden reach the road because I believed it hit the building, but it, it was stunned. I don't know if what happened to it after that. There's nothing I could do further. So that's that was a proper way I thought of handling that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I seen the other day that I thought was interesting was a, a meme. They have a deer crossing a road and it says, hey, you know, we constantly ask, why does the deer cross the road? We don't ask why the road is in the middle of the woods. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I tell people all the time is like, nobody consulted with the turtles when we built Route 95 up north of New Hampshire. You know, it was, uh, we, we divided their habitats. Yeah. 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 It's a, uh, and contrary to popular belief, we are not in a housing shortage. So this is, it's financially, people are buying, uh, just this apartment complex that I'm in now, a big company bought it up and they're gonna charge an extra $200 and they're gonna, they're actually screwing up the apartments because the electrics are so bad in it, they're adding a, a whole nother electric appliance to it. So it's like, you guys didn't fix that, but yet, you're going to put this in and make it look better without actually fixing it. So it's like, yeah, things like that happen. Yeah. It's not a, not a big fan yeah. of this, but that kind of stuff. So that's, that's what's happening to the world and we don't, but that's, that's a different thing. Um, what it looked like on the site, mainly how you guys want people to help you seems to be that you just want people to call in and tell you where animals are, where they saw them. Yeah, so that, that uh, informs a lot of our research is the, is the public reporting process. And 
Um, so any reptile and amphibian in New Hampshire that's observed and photographed should be sent to us. And we put that into a database and it helps us map their geographic range in the state. That also goes even broader and, it, you know, it produces these maps that you see of their, their you know, North American range. Um, so that's really important. And it, and it also it just gives us these kind of like these locations where we have real hot spots, you know, real high densities of, a, you know, a certain species of turtle or snake or salamander. Um, but it also helps keep the public involved in the level at a level that's both safe and um, you know really really helpful for conservation. <clears throat> people really want to help, and that's the thing. And when you, when you talk about people wanting to help an animal that's injured, it's just you know their hearts in the right place. They don't always do the right thing because they might not have the resources to do that. Um, and they should, like you said, absolutely contact a licensed rehabilitator because those people work miracles and, and they know things that I certainly don't. Um, and they, they've saved turtles that to me look like, you know, they should be long gone, huge cracked shells hit by cars and they can, they can rehab them and they, they can survive. But anyway, so getting back to it, yeah, the, it, it's a way for the public to get involved. It really helps us because we can't be everywhere in the state. <clears throat> I'm the only turtle biologist in the state. So, uh, so that's, that's huge. huge. Yeah, that's, I'm sure you're overloaded with stuff then. Yeah, we all are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. 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 So, uh, getting to your, uh, what you were trying to talk about. I will bring that one up on screen. I actually like this one. This was something I thought was interesting. Um, your pie chart here is interesting. See, Missouri, we have tax for our conservation. Yep, yep. Which is one big reason why our conservation is so wonderful here. Well, we have such great conservation. You guys, is this like how do you guys get your funding is what we're seeing here that a federal so so i'm curious i'm wondering if missouri also gets funding so through the taxes does the federal government match it is that what yeah so I, a lot of the states are you know follow a similar model it's just the uh the percentages are, are usually different and so we have a very, very tiny slice of state revenue. So that would be tax revenue. Um, and so we have to make up for that in our these federal grants. Um, we also have a conservation license plate that people can voluntarily get for their car. Um, that extra $5 for registration uh, goes into uh, conservation for us. Um, but it also goes into historical and cultural resources in the state as well. Um, and then donations. So we sort of function like a nonprofit in a lot of ways, even though we are part of a state agency. Um, and so Missouri may have a bigger percentage of state revenue going towards, you know, endangered species conservation, but they're still getting these federal grants to help these projects. And, you know, it's, it takes a lot of money to fund a project for three years. You know, you got staff uh, time, you have, uh, you know, the technology that we use for monitoring and, you know, it just goes on and on. And then another habitat projects cost, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. In yeah, this is showing us that uh, you have your moose plate at 29%. Your private donations, 12. Other revenue, 5%. New Hampshire State General Fund, 4%. Other comp, uh, grants, 1%. And then the federal grants, 49%. That's, uh, that's interesting. I'm just wondering what can the public do besides that and just donating? I mean... 
need more donates. Where does uh, the overwhelming general donations come from? It comes from anybody in the state who, you know, wants to contribute to, you know, endangered species conservation. And so, you know, we do, uh, we do mailings and, um, like, you know, press releases and things like that to try to get more donations. But, uh, you know, you can, people can donate $5, they can donate $10,000. There's no, there's no, there's no limit to it. Um, and so, you know, just spreading the word, <clears throat> the, the, the money goes really far and it's, and it's, uh, critical for us yeah it really is like people don't understand like uh i was talking about earlier i was talking about me just doing psychological studies in herpiculture well i'm i'm actually trying to treat it like a real study while being entertaining so i'm spending my own money like it's it's not free for me yeah. to do that and so people need to understand that you know i am legitimately taking this seriously because i am spending cash like studies don't just fly out of people's butts i mean they yep, just yep. they actually have a lot of cost to them yeah. and uh, it's it's interesting uh i'm i'm doing connecticut later this week and they also have a volunteer thing do you guys have anything like that yeah, so we, um, I take volunteers out every year to help with projects, monitoring. Um, you know, it's one of those things that if it's, you know, it's got to be the right fit. Um, so the work that I do is physically intensive. We're going out, we're doing, we're surveying large areas all day long in the, the hot, the cold, the ticks, the black flies, everything. And so, um, but I'm always happy to take people out to help. Um, we also have other, you know, voluntary programs like frog surveys that people can get involved in, like frog calling surveys to help us identify where the rare populations are in the state. Um, all that can be found on our website. But it's a great way to get involved. Sometimes it's, you know, for younger people who are just wanting to get into the field or just graduated school or whatever, it's a great way to get some experience, try to figure out if this is something they want to do, um, get a taste for what, you know, field study is like. I hear a lot of like uh, breeders and stuff talk about how, you know, well, we're doing conservation work. We're doing, it. and you know, sometimes it's like, eh, they're a little iffy there, but, I don't know. I've been imagining that possibly doing a thing where it's like, okay, if you volunteer an hour to help your local conservation in, in your state and you show up me documentation, when I start making products that I, I'm trying to make that, that I'll make in the future that, you know, maybe I'll go, well, I'll give you 10% off if you show me that you've worked an hour to volunteer to help. I think that's something that that's actually important and even if nobody ever takes you up on it it lets people know that it's there yeah, yeah. that's the thing often advertisement just keeping it in people's faces that every state has to have its conservation we are not just blindly doing this yeah yeah there, there's a general uh, guy up there he said he works with you guys every now and then uh kevin from nerd mm -hmm. have you have you met him i haven't actually met him but yeah. okay because i was gonna ask what's the takeaway from like interacting with the like so, you know have you messed with people like that and what's the takeaway that you've got from dealing with breeders and people that sell and so there's basically just a protocol that i follow for anybody who wants to get involved um so anybody who wants to do conservation work of endangered species in the state has to have training has to have a scientific collection permit through us and they have to follow um some pretty strict protocols for handling animals 
especially anybody who is in uh, the pet trade, because a lot of studies now are showing that pathogens can stay on your skin for longer than they thought. And so if you're feeding your Gulf Coast box turtles in your you know yard pen or whatever, and then you're going out and handling a wild Eastern box turtle, you could be transmitting a, pa a pathogen to that turtle and then that population. So there's a very kind of strict protocol for working with endangered species, especially handling them. Um, so that's the one thing that I think that anybody who wants to get involved in that stuff, contact your state agency, figure out the process, start volunteering and, you know, get that information, get those references in place. So do you have a good idea, a good idea of how these things can um, affect wild populations? Because I, I think a lot of people, you know, don't understand how bad it can get. And it's not well publicized that, you know, we have um, documentation of turtle die-offs because of uh, a non-native pathogen that's shown up in their population. Uh, that in some cases, especially in New Hampshire, where we're at the northern range of a lot of these species, um, the loss of one local population can be devastating for the entire population. And so, you know, and then you add to it all these other threats, you know, that their loss of habitat, the road mortality, it just continues to chip away at the at the population numbers. And eventually you get to a point where they're so low, <clears throat> there's a bunch of things that happen. The ge genetic diversity is low. There's not enough females to produce enough young to persist in the future. So it's just cascading events from little tiny uh, actions. Yeah, I've uh, I've got I did a couple uh, like I computer programmed some chaos theory, so I actually have some understanding of actually what chaos theory is. <laughs> I had somebody try to argue with me on the internet that that chaos theory has nothing to do with invasive species. It's like no, chaos theory is actually mathematics. It's not just something happens and it causes something. No, no, that random doesn't actually exist in the universe. Everything has a cause and everything has, but it's, it's always like, I'm always torn because when you think of chaos theory, you need to think of, uh, the dial on the, the, uh, you know, radio equilibrium. So when you have a channel that you're hearing music from, that's an equilibrium. The, as you move, that equilibrium changes. And so you get that white noise, you get the static. And so then that noise comes in, so you change the dial till you find another equilibrium. That's how chaos theory actually works. It's always finding an equilibrium. And it's always interesting. It depends on if you see zero as an equilibrium or not on how you might see like it affecting wild populations, like the chaos theory of it. And it's, <laughs> so it's, it, even if you lost a population, it's gonna go back to zero or it's going to go to an equilibrium, but who knows how long it's gonna take? Who knows this? It's gonna change anyway. There's so much more to it that it's too complex for the human mind to truly comprehend. So that's why you have your statistics and everything, but it's still like we're, we're going at it way too fast. And it's, I'm a big fan of, yes, let's quarantine our animals. I just found out this week that there is actually home tests for snakes for like the Nile virus and things like that. Like they're, they actually have it in Canada and I'm going like, why do we not have like, I, I don't have snakes, so I didn't know that. But it's like, I'm trying to get those people on so I can understand the numbers. Because mm -hmm. what is it like 70% accurate? Is it 60%? Is it 80%? So then that determines how many times you should, instead of, oh, well, it's not accurate enough. No, that just determines how many times you should use it. Like actually do it before you put it into your collection. 
And then, like you said, like it's you getting that out into the wild. It's it, it's just wow, ridiculous how easy that actually is to do by accident. Well, and this is the uh, example that I always use because it's the scariest of them all. And it, and it was the white nose syndrome in bats. That was the fastest decline in in a native species that we've probably ever seen. We lost 90% of some of the species of bats in North America. And um, all because somebody had a tiny bit of fungus from a cave they picked up in Europe. They brought their boots over to, the, to North America. They went into a cave and the fungus spread like wildfire. That one little event and it just and it just spread and it depleted the bats to now where many of them are becoming federally endangered. When I was a kid in New Hampshire, you go out at dusk and bats are just flying over your head. Like, I mean, they're everywhere. Now you see one bat and you get excited. You know, it, it's just, it's scary how fast it changed and it could happen with any other species depending on the pathogen and where it's introduced. And so we just have to be really careful of that stuff because it's invisible. You know, you don't know what you have on your hands, under your fingernails, you know, like picking up salamanders with bare hands and you've got something on you that absorbs right through the skin. Yeah, I, I don't actually like the word invisible here because I think, <laughs> I think it tells the audience that there's no way to tell. I think to, to, to most people, they're automatically going to go, oh, well, then how am I supposed to how am I supposed to actually know this? Well, like I just said, there's tests, uh, fecals like uh, these pathogens. We, we like to we don't think enough of this. Even I didn't think enough of this until I started studying the uh, polymer topic of uh, how to target cancer cells and stuff, because uh, poly uh, your DNA is actually a polymer. So their polymer means for the audience, it means many molecules. So therefore, uh, like parasites, people like, wow, well, or mites even. Like, how am I supposed to tell what mites? It's like, all I do is take a wet wipe and wipe down my animals, get in all the crevices. And if I can't see anything on that, I'm pretty sure they don't have mites. I mean, it's, it's that simple to tell, but yet like parasites are also like, well, that's really hard to see. No, it's not. You just need a microscope and you can buy a $30 microscope and see it. I, I'm not even unsold that the kid's microscope wouldn't work for parasites because yeah. they're not they're not even at a DNA level and DNA is actually macro not micro okay. it's still in our realm of reality yeah and i think for the average person when i say invisible it's like viruses bacteria and fungus um these things for the average person are invisible and that's why the it's always got to be precaution you know handling wild animals is never a good idea if you have to Wear nitrile gloves if you can, if you have to, you know if you if you can um, wash your hands you know if you're doing anything like um, you know any kind of field studies and you have to handle animals like we sterilize everything with a bleach solution to kill any viruses that could be on our, our gear our you know measuring equipment stuff like that because you know it is invisible viruses are, they're invisible. And, and we don't know how they're transmitting and, uh, and how long they can survive in many cases on, on surfaces. And that's, uh, that's something that's very important that people really do not think about. I mean, just the basics of washing your hands. Yeah. yeah. When I get back from a show, an ex expo, even if I know everybody there, I will still take off my clothes and put them in the hamper because I don't want them. 
I don't want mites or anything that just might have accidentally come off of something else to infect my animals. Yeah. And you just there even the best show is gonna have at least one animal that might be sickly that's asymptomatic. It's the talk in quarantine. Is it is it time or is it uh, you know something else? Because you know I think the reason why we talk about as time. Oh well, quarantine for a month or quarantine for three months is now the new preference. It's for two reasons. One, people are stupid. They don't they don't have or maybe not stupid. They're ignorant. They don't have the knowledge to truly do this. This is why you have to be completely honest with yourself when you get an animal or something that you're just like, no, do I know enough? Do I know enough on this thing to, to really understand this? Then the uh, the other part of that is that asymptomatic that you should normally see it. But in snakes, you still won't see the like the Nile viruses and stuff unless unless you're really looking at their mucus. And same thing with you know fungal outbreaks. Snake fungal disease can be um, it can be a tiny little scale that has a little bit of that fungus on it and or an infection. And unless you really know what you're looking for, it doesn't look it can look like a little spot. You know, and and, and uh, is there. Is there a way people should possibly clean? Like, is there a proper way to clean a rep, like a snake or something that that would uh, lower that if somebody were to pull it out of the wild? I mean, you really need a, a, a fungal treatment. Uh, and so it's not something that... You, yeah, it's not something that I would I would recommend anybody messing around with. I wouldn't either, and that's kind of like like iffy things there, where it's like if you know what you're doing, then yes. But yeah. ninety percent of people are not going to know what they're doing. Uh, when I interviewed uh, Jeff Brigler of Missouri, he was talking about finding hellbender eggs, being one of the first people to be able to find them. I never asked him how because I don't want the public to know that. If if you actually are working with him, then yeah, you should know that. Yeah, step on him. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, yeah, I don't want people down there just going to try to find them on their own. They could do so much damage. Yeah, I mean, just flipping over rocks, looking for hellbenders, they can do dam dam damage in the streams, you know, and, and it happens a lot, um, so. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. I mean, I love when the public gets involved, when the public gets excited, especially out looking for snakes and stuff like that. But there's got to be real caution. You know, if you're doing it as a, as a hobby, like wear the nitro gloves and change them after each snake that you hold. It's just good practice. Um, you know, flipping rocks. Be really careful. Don't flip a rock that's too heavy for you because I've seen it before where somebody is all excited because there's a smooth green snake under a rock and they drop the rock. You know, I mean, it may be not a big deal. It's just one, one instance. But, you know, if you got lots of people doing it in lots of different parts of the state, it, it can have an impact over time. Yeah, I've got Savannah monitor babies, and they love to be between rocks, and I I worry the hell out of it. Like, just like, man, just one slip. Yep, yep. And it's like, yeah, they... It's, it's something to actually be concerned with. And that's also what, you know, we need a little more training in how we... how the public responds to things where we don't get overloaded. Okay, and the best way that I know to do this is to start training people to take things too far and then to actually use their knowledge to rope it back in. So when you start panicking, it's okay, stop, slow down. What do I know? Let's take steps back because this is the knowledge that I have. So we deal with it that way. That's... Um, I, I've been, uh, 
I may run for government. I don't want to. I really don't. I, I, I hate the idea, but I feel like I'm obligated because I know I can, because I can fit into all these different categories that we actually need in leaders now that we don't have. Like the diseases, understanding that, understanding things like that. But so getting a new law passed, because I would like to see something happen to where we give more information to people. You know how many people don't know how to read a light bulb? <laughs> and it's like, wow. So uh, I was talking to one gentleman on a fish deal nice guy came across as a very nice guy and i was explaining the law that they were trying to pass the the, the amendment to the lacy act and uh, it was like wow like that's like it's it's actually going to destroy an industry and everything and then i started talking about the test i want to i want people to take and uh, you know we give more money to uh, conservation for states if you have a licensing so you can't even own a bearded dragon or a leopard gecko without a $20 license. But it's just to take a test to learn humidity, how to read a light bulb, what's the Ferguson zones, just the real basics. That once you have that basics, you should be able to read anything about the animal and have an understanding of what you need for that animal. It's not, oh, well, this is exactly how you do this animal. That's not going to be good. It's, you know, the basics. And we could do it for all exotics, I think. Yeah. And then we have money going towards conservation, and that should help the animals. But even that, that person that I was talking to from the fish thing, they're like, we have a leopard gecko. What's the Ferguson zone law? It's not, a, it's not a law. It's something biologists came up with. <laughs> right. Yeah. Just that lack of knowledge, feeling that is yep. what I want. Yeah. yeah. And even if people only learn enough to pass the test, that's still more than what they had previously. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's a good idea. But like they said, oftentimes that leads to more more restrictions on things yeah i can and that's huh. and that's that's a big fear for a lot of breeders and people is that you'll have even more restrictions on that because i'm pretty sure the overwhelming majority of people would be okay with that yeah yeah, yeah. i don't know what's your thoughts i mean i'm all for education and the more the better um I think that being in the field that I'm in, I see, I see so many people, you know, like desperately trying to get rid of their python, their turtle, their, you know, they, they started taking care of it. They got in over their head. It was too hard, too much work and they're done or the animal's now sick or, you know, they need, uh, they don't have the money for a vet or whatever. And it's like, you know, to, to eliminate even a small percentage of that would be, would be great. You know, it's just hard to see. I mean, it's hard to see somebody not, you know, taking care of their dog, you know, I mean, I mean, any pet, you know, it's, you got to take it seriously with the commitment in some cases, like, um, you know, if you own a Russian tortoise, that tortoise could outlive you. <laughs> like, that's a commitment. <laughs> yeah, I've talked about that on this show several times. It, yeah. It's it's actually best to have a license, life insurance, and because I've already got people that I've I've talked to, friends of mine that that it's like, would you guys, if something were to happen to me, would you guys? Because I know that you love these animals, and I think that you would actually appreciate them. And so then I need to get me a life insurance so that, and then if I do start a company, they'll get the company with the reptiles so that they can actually take care of the reptiles properly. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's a very interesting thing that people don't talk enough about. There's a lady in, uh, I watch uh, Animals at Home. Dylan Parrish is a good friend of mine now. 
because of these podcast things and stuff. The um, there's a lady. He does all sorts of stuff. There was a guy, a vet he had on, that had a tr- that uh, from Texas, who's trying to figure out new ways to helping turtles, like you said, that got ran over. Yeah. And so then it gets bacteria infection. So can he put it into a bubble, basically? How do you do that? And that's what he's he's doing that a vacuum bubble. Yeah. And it was quite interesting. And then, like, the lady from... Uh, she just became a uh, wildlife rehabilitator herself. But she actually has, like, a list of things that you can actually do to actually... Um, for wheels and testaments and to where you can leave your animals to certain people and things like that. That's so that's becoming more mainstream thanks to people like her. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, what are some of the well we've talked about that conservation. There's often talk about uh, reaching out to you guys about in various corners, there's often people, I don't want to reach out to them because, you know, when they make laws, do you have, like, when people, are you consulted? Wait, say one more time, it's just a uh, hiccup there for a second. Sorry. Uh, so when, when they make laws about reptiles in your state, are you consulted? Yeah. So there's a process in the state, and it goes through um, a, a series of steps. And it starts with the science, and then it goes up the ladder from there for different um, for different input and approvals and things. And so it's science based, um, and then there's a public input process there as well so if we're going to propose a change to the reptile and amphibian rules in the state you know there's a there's an opportunity for the public to weigh in on that um so yeah we're very involved in the process and uh but again it's science-based and we have to use the data that we collect to make those decisions because you can't just one day wake up and say I think those are going to be endangered now because I haven't seen that many. We actually have to have numbers to back that up. So every state goes through that same process. Um, and, you know, we visit those every five to 10 years, take a hard look at them, look at our data, and see if there's any changes needed. And a lot of states, we've seen changes, but they've been fairly small changes. Um, a good example is some of the southern states, Virginia is one of them, where they had to dial back their snapping turtle harvest numbers significantly because they were being over-harvested to a point where they were seeing a rapid decline in populations. Um, You know, you have to watch that stuff because, you know, I mean, that's how they manage white-tailed deer and bear. You know, every year they track the harvests, the harvest numbers, so they know where to set their limits. You know, what's the harvest limit for this county? And, you know, how many moose can you take from, you know, this county? Um, just so that natural resource is always there. But anyway, that's sort of how it works. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process and the public is part of that. Yeah, the uh, lots of people don't fully understand conservation anymore. Uh, we had eight black bears killed last year f- with permits. Actually, it's better for conservation because there's no predator for the black bear. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's, it's one of those things. It's, yeah, it sounds really nasty, but they'll eat themselves out of house and home. You know, um, things that we don't often talk about are also things like... Uh, the medical side of this i've actually read somewhere where like the fence lizard blood is used in medication um you know we often the hellbender i take as a uh, canary in a coal mine scenario 
uh, things like uh, the horseshoe crab blood. So you have to make sure they're protected for that reason. And, uh, and that's anything that's ever been injected into your blood has dealt with horseshoe crab blood because of the, uh, the stuff that's in it that collects bacteria. That's how they know if there's bacteria in it. And so then there's, um, there's just things like that. Is there anything like that with you guys, like up, up there with turtles and stuff? Because I don't think there's enough research in it, like with amphibians and stuff that we, we don't take enough away with that. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, turtles aren't being harvested in North America for, for medicine or anything like that. Um, in Asia, they are. Uh, but it's not medicine in the same way. It's more like uh, herbal remedies, sort of homeopathic, sort of naturopathic kind of remedies. Um, it's part of the, it's part of their culture, you know, and, that, and that's why we're seeing our wild turtles in North America getting poached and sent to Asia because they've depleted their population so severely that they need to import. Um, that's that's a whole other topic, but um, but it's present. But I guess the bigger thing, you know, in terms of like human health. So somebody one time asked me, like, um, he said, "That's pretty cool. You work with turtles. You know, I saw a Blanding's turtle one time." He said, "But let me ask you, why should I care if the Blanding's turtle goes extinct?" He's like, "Why does it matter?" He was, you know, sort of hypothetical question. And I was like, damn, that's a hard question. <laughs> but but the, the reality is, is it's just one species in part of a, as part of a, a bigger food web, an ecosystem, and this umbrella of biodiversity. And the one thing that we know is that as biodiversity, biodiversity decreases, the more pathogens jump into human populations because what we're doing when biodiversity gets suppressed is we're artificially selecting the specialist. And so here in New Hampshire, when biodiversity gets low in certain areas, white-footed mice come and fill those gaps. White-footed mice, are, they, they can survive in almost any different habitat that you put in the landscape. They also happen to be the reservoir for Lyme disease, and the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. And that has serious consequences for humans, especially here in New Hampshire. Um, you know, it's a, it's a huge problem. And there's other parts of that, but, um, but protecting biodiversity is, you know, going to basically be a buffer uh, between animal disease and human disease. The um, the only animal that I've ever heard that could possibly go extinct and may not actually hurt us is the mosquito, except for one that's in Alaska that actually flowers things. So it, it does that. And I'm not even sold on that. I'm not either, because I'm not sure that if you think about mosquitoes flying around, that's one thing. But think about mosquito larva and the millions of them that are in the water and all the animals that feed on those larva. It's a whole other world. And yeah. See, uh, years ago, there was a study done where they took a mosquito male and they actually made him genetically to where his offspring will yeah, explode yeah. in larva. It took me years to find that paper. A Brazilian girl had to send it to me. And like, it was 96% of the population in that area went down, yeah. but that was in Brazil. You know what also happened in Brazil? Zika. Zika. Yeah. <laughs> but that's also because they have the second highest population of, uh, of Japanese in the world. And uh, the Zika virus actually split into two, African and the Asian strain. And the African strain's even worse. It actually kills the babies in the womb. 
they don't like that. So the Zika, the Asian virus is what got to there. And I've always had that, that in the back of my mind, those two connections. Yeah, yeah. On those things. And it's like, uh, maybe it affected Zika. Maybe it didn't. It's not necessarily like that's really hard to say because of the amount of viruses that mosquitoes pass on. Right, right. And so it's, yeah, losing anything. And uh, there's a guy at work who was uh, Middle Eastern. And he came to me one day because I'm pretty vocal about being reptile guy. But it leads to often sometimes some very interesting conversations. I've had several people go, oh, my God, dude, I, I almost caught this lizard for you in my house. But I'm like, no, he lives in the wall and eats the bugs. I'm like, no, I'll let him be. I love that. To me, that's awesome to, yeah, yeah. to try to figure out that cohabitation between us and the animals that are just wild. Like, yeah, let them live in your wall. He's like, I named it Fred. <laughs> and it's like, that's great. But the, uh, the, the Middle Eastern guy came to me one day and he goes, uh, where would I get snake snakes shed? Because, I, you know, uh, it's, it's part of my uh, religion, like to actually make it into some sort of medicine or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay. Like, I'm, I'm sure I can find you a, br uh, you know, somebody that's got a snake that will sell you a shed. I mean, right. it's, it's like, it's <laughs> like, that. that's fine. As long as you're not like, you know, killing the animal. Yeah. Go to a pet store. You can get a ton of them. Yeah. That's like, yeah, I'm fine with that. But it's, it's interesting. It is. And, yeah. and that's the stuff we're always fighting with, you know, it's just that in between on what somebody else is doing compared to what we're doing. What can we do better? I really do like uh, the way you guys have your your setup of your uh, website. It's it's quite nice, and uh, I hope people will take away from this that you know, are you approachable? Like, can people just contact you directly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I, uh, one of my favorite things like you is educating the public. And so, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do is, is quiet and we're out of the public view only because there's not a real platform for me to advertise that, you know, um, well, we do press releases for stuff like that, but like, I mean, I can't tell you, you know, especially during the spring when all the reptiles are starting to emerge here, like, um, the calls have been a milk snake in their basement or a turtle coming up in their yard and like just giving them a little information about why it's there what it's doing is it you know it's harmless and and, and it changes their whole perspective and, it, and maybe it saves that one snake's life and maybe they tell their kids hey that's a milk snake it's going to eat the mice in your house and it's not going to hurt you it's okay and let me it's just one of the best parts of the, of the job and, and presenting all these results to people, giving, giving them the information that I've collected over the last decade or so. What are some of the best? See, I do that psychological studies in herbiculture and I test for the individual, their creativity and their empathy. And there's multiple types of empathy. It's not actually one type of thing. And that's very misconception that people have because you really have to understand neuroscience or at least understand some more psychology to understand that. And so what are some of the things that you have found talking to people that led them? Like, what are some of the wording that you've used? Because it's interesting because I get on some of the best in the hobby and I have been shocked at what kind of empathies they don't have, but yet they still have empathy, but they don't have the empathy I thought they would over, overall. And yet these are, these are people that preach about bigger enclosures, more naturalistic, more, you know, these are people that preach about care of these animals. So it's very interesting to me to understand how to better talk to people. You, you, you always got to meet people where they're at, right? And so I think it's hard to find a person in, in you know, where I work that doesn't like turtles. Everybody kind of loves them. They're just like, well, they're, you know, they look friendly, they have a shell, they're harmless, all this other stuff. 
But when it comes down to it, you know, like getting people to do the right thing for turtle populations in the state, what's their motivation? You know, is, is doing something to protect turtles going to affect their ability to live their lives? Is it going to affect their ability to build a house? Is it going to affect their ability to whatever it is? And so some people just, they need that motivation. And so you got, you got to find out what it is that they're um, either holding them back or that, that what they're, or what they're involved in, their background. Um, and so it's hard because when I give presentations and talks, I'm usually giving it to a bunch of people who are there because they really care about conservation. You know, I'm not necessarily giving presentations to people who want to like bulldoze a swamp and put in 50 apartment buildings. You know, they're kind of like, they're in a different world. So, you know, there's a certain percentage of the public, you're just not going to break through. You know, it's like the fear of snakes. Um, that's good. That's a really tough one. It's a tough egg to crack, you know. That, that's built into people's DNA. And I'm never going to convince somebody that, or I'm never going to be able to turn somebody's fear of snakes around, you know. I mean, I may be able to, you know, at least give them the information to help them control their fears so that they don't go out and take a shovel to every snake that they see. And that's a, that's a victory, but that's about as far as you can get with it. See, I, I take my dragons out when it's summertime, my bearded dragons, and I walk them, and I'll usually go to Walmart or something afterwards. I mean, it's 90, 80 degrees out. It's not a big deal for them. Right. And I've had people come up to me and go, dude, I'm terrified. I'm like, do you want to hold it? Like, I, I understand if you don't, I want to meet you on your level. But if you want to hold it, you can. She's not going to have any issue with you holding her. It's fine. Oh my God, this is this is great. Like, oh, oh my God, this is just like such a different attitude. But I also wonder if anthropomorphic, like I said, uh, taking something too far and then using your knowledge to rein it in may be a different approach. So actually anthropomorphizing the animals and then using that where people go, well, they love me. Like, no, they really don't. They would eat you if they, if they could, but they do bond with you. They do have a desires and thoughts. They don't just, they're not just like, I even have videos on do reptiles turn on a dime. No, they actually often have a delay. They're not feared for their lives or they're not somehow trained even by accident. Cause that's, you know, feeding time. This is what we do. This is how this works. Even if you're, you don't mean to, you might just accidentally train them that way. Mm -hmm. If they're not that, they usually have a delay in their brain because it's not a common thing for them. So it's okay. Then even their fear sometimes response is a delay. Uh, calm fancy sometimes gets over. He used to get overwhelmed when I would take him out and that would be a delay. Usually like all of a sudden it's like, no, he should have been reacting to that like a minute ago, but because of that delay, he's reacting to it now instead of then. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's quite fascinating, yeah. but it's, so maybe anthropomorphizing them to where people can actually understand them. The bearded dragons, I don't know a single reptile so far that I've had that actually likes pooping in their enclosure. Mm -hmm. I think we can all relate to that. Yeah. I think, you know, I mean. No, I mean, you know, a lot of the, you know, academic training and stuff is to, to you know, for scientists not to anthropomorphize the species you're working with. That has its place. But for the for the general public, I think it's a good thing, you know, because like you said, it, it does create empathy and they see, they see that life force, they interpret it however they want to interpret it. 
but it's usually positive, you know, or because it's either they see it as fearful, they see it as happy, content, whatever. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no reason for them to to not do that. Yeah, and that's and no, and people will take it too far. It's it's a human yeah. nature to either take something too far or to not take it far enough. Yeah, I don't want to see somebody putting a bow on a turtle's head and a little dress. That's yeah, little, I'm not uh, a big fan of that either. It's, <laughs> but it's kind of like I don't like. Uh, I'm actually trying to get some people on. Uh, I'm working on getting an episode of uh, psychological studies and herpiculture on what kind of people make clothes for reptiles. Oh. <laughs> let's let's see what kind of empathy they have. Let's see what kind of that. I'm very curious to see if they have the empathy that the other people don't have. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. It's, it's fascinating to think about this stuff in these terms. And it's, this isn't stuff that are normally talked about. And that's what I'm hoping to bring to the community. Like you said, you don't have a platform that, that you normally have. So I'm trying to fill that role and learn about laws and stuff. I don't want to just jump at anything. Yep, yep. That's not how we want it. But then also, you know, anthropomorphizing to the point that you're actually hurting the animals is is a mistake that's where knowledge comes in plus i'm i'm not sold that anthro uh that uh creating more empathy helps sell more animals for breeders mm -hmm. i think that might that may or may not take away from sales from a breeder if they make it more empathetic mm -hmm. but the people will probably be more likely to take care of that animal. But like you said, if it's not a direct relation to their lives, then it might not be the, it, it may not last. Right, right. But this is also why, uh, what's the first thing somebody wants after having a positive experience? Another one. Right. I mean, it's, it's literally that simple. So what I always recommend is get your basics down and then experiment and care. Because what that's going to do is if you can get any positive result, it's going to make you do more and it's going to make you put in more time and effort and learn more and do more. And you're going to find more positive in it. And it's just going to make you want to care for that particular animal even better. Yep. And so you won't be out there in the wild looking at them like that. But then also, uh, I'm trying to find some people on that do uh, herping. They go around the world and herp. Yep, yep. Does that increase empathy? They say it does, but does it really? I think that what it does is it appeals to people on an aesthetic level. So people are herping all over the world and they're presenting really beautiful pictures of either habitat or the animal. Um, people can look at it and then, you know, it, that's a positive. You know, there's, they're seeing an animal in a different, uh, you know, it's not just a slimy snake, it's a beautiful coral snake that, you know, is endangered and um, not that scary when you look at it. Well, I will link everything in the description that we've talked about. Great, great. It's, it's been a pleasure. Hydra, my uh, youngest, is uh, giving me the signs that he's either... Most likely, he has to come out to poop. Yep, yep. <laughs> or he's already pooped and he wants out. That's something that people don't often understand is that they... Uh, even if you clean up the poop... And they're still like, because poop particles go into your nose. That's how you smell them. So if that dragon's still smelling that poop, he still wants out, even though the enclosure is clean. Yeah. yeah. So it's not. And once again, there's delays. So it's it's fascinating when you start looking at them like this. So uh, I probably should get to him. Sure. <laughs> and you've got, I'm sure you've got thousands of things. Hey, I want to tell you how much I appreciate how fast you were. Like, it's very interesting on just the fact of how I'm going about getting uh, the herpetologists on here. It's very interesting. You were the only one that's just like, yeah, let's talk about loss. Let's do this. 
I appreciate that because it's it's very telling sometimes. Well, can we have final say of the video? Yeah, I'm not here to make you guys look bad. I'm yeah. here actually to find information. And, you know, I, it doesn't matter what I think. You guys have the data. So we're going to go off of that. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. I mean, it was uh, the way I look at it is that anytime I get an opportunity to talk about reptiles and amphibians and the work that I do, it's it's enjoyable. So yeah, uh, and New New Hampshire's not the first place people think of when you think of reptiles, right? right. Yeah, like it's like no, no, there there is. It's like that's very interesting, yeah. and uh, like I talked about in Missouri. Maybe conservation is also the fact that there's a lot of land here we can't build on because of flooding issues. Maybe that's one reason why Missouri conservation is so well. Or I, I don't know if I could say the same about New, uh, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of protected land that's either protected by the state or like the White Mountain National Forest, big chunks of land. Luckily, those are untouchable, but everything else is up for grabs for the most part, you know. So there's a there's a push and a pull between development and um, conservation, uh, and there absolutely should be. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. That's what you know. No matter who you are or what you do, there absolutely should be a push and pull. Like I said, the housing market is not saturated. We we have enough housing for everybody. We do not have enough affordable housing for everybody. Yeah. So this isn't let's build so that we can do this. This is no, we need to keep conservation for actual good reasons. And if we're going to be in this hobby and we're not doing conservation at all, then what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> like, you love the animals, but then what happens then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Anytime you want to come on for any reason that you're like, man, I got this exact thing that I need to get to the public. I got this thing like that. You are always welcome to holler at me. Okay. okay. Yeah, about anything. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. You do the same. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. As long as I don't get the poop on me. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>